Well, it's recording. Good morning. How's your weekend? This week, we are going to learn two things. One is aerodynamics, and another one is flat dynamics. So two dynamics. All right. So they're supposed to be a very uh, dense, packed in three hours each. So uh, let's uh, try uh, our journey in aerodynamics. So I'll do my best to bring you up so that you have a basic understanding of aerodynamics. Because it is really hard to claim you are a drone scientist or you are a, a drone engineer. Okay, um, without knowing aerodynamics. So, so here is uh, something I hope you will going to uh, read. So this is uh, chapter two on aerodynamics of flight. So precisely speaking, aerodynamics of flight is the more accurate title of uh, well, this module. So basic aerodynamics of flight. Okay. So there are other aerodynamics problems, for example, like a uh, wind turbine. So you drive through the uh, Livermore Canyon, you, you saw lots of uh, the wind turbines. So those interaction aerodynamics, the study of that is also aerodynamics, but the aerodynamics of wind turbine, okay? And so there are also uh, like uh, aerodynamics of uh, high rising buildings, right? Uh, uh, aerodynamics of uh, raising uh, cars, like a Lamborghini, you know, you, you know, you drive very fast, the aerodynamics will kick in, you know. It will be deciding factor who is more efficient, okay. So that's, uh, that's what I'm trying to explain here regarding aerodynamics of flights. So this is a more accurate title, okay? aerodynamics of flight, okay, of flight. Talking about things flying. And then this one, we have a local copy put in. So I'm going to, uh, actually you can download, but I'll try to place into our directory. So it is called Pilot Handbook, okay? Pilot Handbook. So this is a very comprehensive, authoritative explanation of basic knowledge of aerodynamics, okay? In a university setting, aerodynamics is usually a semester long course. And a uh, comprehensive textbook of aerodynamics could be a uh, one inch thick, okay? And uh, about two pounds, okay? Uh, so, uh, on the other hand, <clears throat> on the other hand, these two online uh, resources, I consider they are really good. Uh, they are really good. Um, in terms of, uh, in the university, college, aerodynamics, and the ME program. This one is uh, mainly for fixed wing in from uh, Brigham Young University. Uh, it is a wonderful set of slides and also a, a project design for it. So it's pretty good. So I encourage you to explore these two links. And I'll talk to some of the slides from there. Um, so additionally, as of last night, while preparing my today's three hours aerodynamics course, I discovered that um, there are three modules um, here. Uh, it's by the website called Pilot Training System. It's to train those men pilot. Okay, we are talking about license from FAA for unmanned aircraft, uh, uh, UAS. But this is for men pilots. So the private pilot. So this uh, tutorial number four, there are three parts, all focused on aerodynamics. So today, uh, if time allows, we are going to, uh, in the end of this lecture, okay, we'll take a break. Then uh, we'll see if we have enough time to watch. Uh, if we don't have time to watch, you are required to watch. So it's a, it's a recap of what we just learned. So it's a really good, it's a really good. So today we have some uh, basic uh, uh, aerodynamics <coughs> quiz questions, so I hope you will be able to answer. And there's something you cannot, uh, especially the last one, I forgot how to answer it. 
<laughs> okay? So, um, but don't worry, we are going to go there and I give you a hint, okay? So, so first question is, what is aerodynamics? Okay, the second question is, who cares? <laughs> so, you know, aerodynamics, who cares, right? So, so whenever you learn something, you should ask, who cares, okay? What is this and who cares, okay? Okay, why I should learn, okay? So aerodynamics, according to the dictionary, is a branch of dynamics. So there are so many dynamics, right? Dealing with the motion of air and other gaseous flu fluids, with the forces acting on bodies in motion relative to such fluids. So gas is a fluid. Okay, so that definition is trivial, right? It's a trivial. So, but however, we explain aerodynamics to uh, small kids. They will say, oh, define aerodynamics for me. Then you should be able to, to, to say something like this, okay? So, who cares? Who cares? So you can see high-speed train, okay? You can see the biking. Uh, you can see the luxurious car they designed as, you know, they're the, the, the external shape, okay? Why they optimize the shape like that, you know? Of course, we, are, we care about aircrafts, but uh, there are some other things like uh, you, have, you have interaction between air and water and fast moving the boat. So this also aerodynamics. Okay, okay, and uh, they can have something called uh, personalized, personalized golf balls. So they give you a golf ball aerodynamics. Okay, so a lot of things. So then uh, the second, the third question is, uh, first question is what is aerodynamics and who cares? Uh, this one we can elaborate long enough. This motivation is very rich. So as a mechanic engineer, engineering student, you, most of you are, um, without aerodynamics knowledge, it, it's, it's a regret, okay? It's, it, because you interact with air all the time, <laughs> okay? All the time, so. So, but how hard? Third question is how hard, okay? How, how, how hard? So it could be really hard as a semester long tech elective. Okay, so in UC Merced, we have uh, ME136. Uh, it's taught by uh, Professor Ayaswamy uh, Venkat. He taught this several times, but it's not offered every year, every year. So once it's offered, I suggest you, you, you take it, okay? Uh, so let's take a look at what they want. So the mathematics is a prerequisite 120, I don't know what is this. Do you have an idea? Fluid dynamics, probably. And they have a laboratory. And so it's a methodology for conducting wind tunnel experiments. Do you know what is a wind tunnel? Yes. So you, you do a control airflow to check the interaction. And understand the navier stokes equation, understanding the scaling principle and Prando system boundary layer theory, boundary layer theory, and circulation, and the vorticity, drag and lift, airfoil theory, source and the vortex panel methods, compressible flow, and stuff like that, okay? So, it's a semester long course. We are going to cover mainly um, uh, aerodynamic concepts in this, uh, Three hours session, okay. Three hour session, and uh, uh, as you know that <clears throat> my background is a control person. I do systems and controls, electronics, okay, actuators, sensors, control designs. But uh, w what is my qualification to teach you aerodynamics? Is this uh, I just learn? Uh, 
two months ago, <laughs> then I, I teach you, is not. So let's, uh, I, I gave a last slide um, to tell you that in, indeed I have something. I, so this is my last slide. <clears throat> this is my last slide. So uh, I did some work on that. For my, uh, in 1988, I did my master thesis, f uh, finished my master thesis, talking about flying vehicle. Flying vehicle meaning drones, missiles, rockets, cannon projectiles, all those are flying objects, right? So it's not necessarily flying vehicle. I, I, how to simulate this? And the question is how you can identify aerodynamic coefficients from the range test data. You shoot it, you measure, so how you can recover aerodynamic coefficients without going into the wind tunnel experiments. Or you have another source, you compare notes. That was my a PhD, uh, not a PhD, a master thesis work about 30 years ago, 1988, 87, yeah, 86, 85. I, start, I started my master's degree, started in 1985. Okay, so that's uh, 32 years ago. So, uh, oh, by the way, do you know this university? It's still this name. There's so many universities in China change the name. This university, university uh, BIT, is in parallel as a, uh, as a Caltech, CIT. Okay. It's, it's uh, with some defense background. Okay. Uh, then, ten years later, I moved to Singapore. Uh, I did my uh, PhD there, and I used some other new techniques and do the same problem using the same data sets, I'm going to be able to extract the, the aerodynamic coefficients without going to the wind tunnel using iterative learning techniques. So I'm the first one using this idea by doing that. And it's published in a, a top tier journal. And also I published a top tier, a top -tier journal on AIWA 10 years later. So you can see 98, 98, 88, 98, 97, 97. So these are the all good journals, okay? Control engineering practice, AIWA journal of aircrafts, uh, journal of spacecraft and the rockets. So I took the aerodynamic course when I was a graduate student. I took flight control systems. I took missile guidance navigation and control course, all three different courses. And we are going to merge these three courses in the one small section of our, our course. So today I'm going to put together uh, like within three hours about aerodynamics. Next lecture, within three hours, we'll do flight dynamics. So uh, first, I believe that uh, I tried my best. Second is I need your collaboration, don't sleep. And uh, you, I'll bring you there. Okay, I'll bring you there. So, just give you that my qualification. So this is a self-promotion type, but I'll just assure you that try uh, pay attention. You'll be you'll be able to do do a good job. Okay. Okay. Uh, so what? Who cares? And how hard? It is very hard. But uh, let's start from high school or maybe middle school. Okay, so what are the basic quantities we already learned? Space, time, matter, and charge. So these are the four things. Okay, four things. So all other quantities of physical quantities are derived from there. So when you heard about this dimension analysis, the units, right? Time is in second, like length in meters, like mass is in kg, okay, kilograms, and charge is in coulomb, okay, and so, forth, so on and so forth. So the derived quantities like velocity, it's length versus time, force is mass length divided by uh, time square, <laughs> time square. 
So this is kind of called a dimensionality analysis. Sometimes when you do dimension analysis, you can discover something physically not right. Okay? Because you cannot go back to the basic quantities. Get it? So having this type of um, called dimensionality analysis is a good idea for you uh, to understand the basic physics because everything should be and could be derived from those basic quantities. If you cannot, then something wrong. Okay. <clears throat> so with that physics as uh, our basics, so we are able to talk about uh, fundamentals of aerodynamics. So aerodynamics is a special type of fluid dynamics because air is also fluid. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so using aerodynamics, we carry the following physical quantities. So like density, force, velocity, moment, pressure, energy, torque, mass flow. So all these can be converted into the basic units. Okay, basic units. Okay. So so these are the uh, possible quantities we are going to use in aerodynamics. But what about temperature? What about temperature? So temperature is actually very complicated, OK? Complicated. So it's basically you need to use the ensemble of uh, the molecules, OK? And they always in a random motion, always in a random motion. So the frequent collision between two molecules so uh, then order the motion superimposed with random motion. So what is the temperature? Temperature is actually the collective kinetic energy of all the uh, gas mod uh, molecules. Okay. Uh, question about temperature? And next, yeah, we're going to talk about conservation laws. So as we learn, uh, our world, something is conserved, OK? OK, it's conserved. So, so observations of the relations between the derived quantities. So you can see, you can, you can, you can see that this is uh, uh, a section of a tube with different surface area. You can see this is like a, a rocket blast propellers here. <coughs> so we can say uh, conservation about mass is obvious. So mass cannot be created or destroyed. It's always there, conservation. So we should have a mass continuity, mass continuity. Movement. It's neither created nor destroyed. It's three directions should be conserved by moments. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. It's conservation of energy. So the, in any fluid system, this conservation of these things should be there. For example, <coughs> you have mass get in, and you have different diameter of the tube. So the mass times the velocity is your uh, moment, momentum. And the uh, mass and velocity squares your energy. So these three quantities will be conserved. OK, will be conserved. So in that sense, you should be able to establish a relationship, OK, relationship. For example, you learn that the, the fluid flowing, the speed of the fluid, once you have a longer ones, then you can see what? It flows slower, OK? Speed is slower. Uh, so that's because of the conservation constraints on that. Uh, how many of you already learned Navier's Stokes equation? Oh, I'm so impressed. So um, I'm not sure you know how to derive it. Uh, but uh, in a nutshell, is this one slide. So um, I guess it's basically the application of the 
of the conservation, what we mentioned about it. You agree? This is very easy for you, I believe. I believe. So let's review the quantities. So there are so many derived quantities. What are those? You have a coordinate, x, y, z. You have velocity components, u, v, w, time, air density, and stress, pressure, total energy, heat flux, Q, and Reynold numbers. We are going to, uh, yeah, I don't have time to uh, explain the Reynold numbers, but we are, we are going to briefly mention that. And Prandtl numbers, PR. So then we'll have something like this. The density, uh, the air density, the rate of the air density, plus the rate, uh, the, the gradient, this partial direction, is three directions of gradient. Uh, Rho times u partial s. So this should be zero. Should be zero. Conserved. Okay. The change. You increase here. You decrease there. Add together. The the change will be zero. Have you uh, tried the water bed in summer? This is called water bed effect. So you have is the bed with water. You. Uh, sit in here, then you have more water there, right? But the total amount of water is the same. So this is considered as some sort of water bed effect. So it's a conservation. Similar things can be established for moment, momentum in uh, three directions, okay? okay? X, Y, Z, okay? Then finally is the energy conservation. Then you can derive things like this. Okay, quite messy, but uh, the basic idea is still like in our previous slide. Okay, I'm not sure you can derive these complicated equations, but I have to tell you, this is not never stops equation is not totally and the problem is not solved. Still, people are exploring this. Exploring this. Okay, so, but this is just too complicated. So what if we did, uh, do, some, do some simple uh, simplifications? Okay, so it's called Euler's equation, talking about steady form, steady form. Steady, what does steady mean? Steady means anything changes over time is zero. Derivative d, d, t, partial, partial, t, all these things are zero. It's called steady, steady in time. It's already after so so long time, it's settled. So that is steady. Then those those t term, partial partial t, these partial partial t terms are all zero. Okay. So then it's called Euler's equation. We are going to have uh, again. We don't consider or consider two d, consider can z. So we have simplified. Uh, never stocks equation, so something like this and this and this. Then uh, this is a, a called steady uh, form. And also, what is an incompressible form? Incompressible form that means the rho, the rho, incompressible, meaning the rho is not a function of x and y. It's a constant. So then when rho is a constant, you just pull out in front and eliminate it. So it becomes like this. It's an like incompressible form. But this is just idealization. It's, it's, it's an assumption. So that's why it will make us, make, make us uh, um, gain more insight for understanding by adding some uh, assumptions. Okay? But in reality, it's compressible. But we ideal, idealize it, say, oh, yeah, this is incompressible. Then it's simpler. OK? Give us insights. So in aerodynamics, you need to learn all these type of simplifications and different cases. So then you draw some conclusion. Then uh, you add corrections on that to reflect the real world situation. See what I mean? Otherwise, if everything is messed like this, and you're starting from here, you don't gain any insights, or you don't. You cannot solve it at all. So, 
All right. <clears throat> so now let's talk about mass flow rate. Okay. So you have something going from here, and then you get amplified in here. So density, velocity, area, area, area is the cross-section area. So you are going to see that the mass flow rate is rho and v and times a. So uh, so you need to check. So this is a very good. This is called dimensionality analysis. Or you need to check. You need to check. So you can see the mass, uh, length, uh, this cube, length, time, and uh, Length square and mass divided by time. Mass. This is the m dot. Okay, so rho is like a, so it looks like correct. Okay, looks like correct. Mass flow rate. So to have a, because mass is not produced or not destroyed, it has to be a constant. So the m dot has to be a constant. Okay, has to be constant. So to have that continuity. All right, so it's moving. This is the most important slide, the next slide, OK? It's called dynamic, dynamic pressure, usually in terms of capital Q. mean is so we use this one as pressure density velocity rho a p and a rho and a u so we know this notation so uh, conservation of fluids we have this and then we just uh, uh, this is the uh, algebra original form then we'll simplify that we try to solve it okay so we are going to have this one okay this one so then when we collect terms, we are going to have this. So this thing should be 0. That means it will be a constant. OK, it will be a constant. And this is uh, static pressure. And this is the total pressure. So this part is what we call dynamic pressure. OK, dynamic pressure. Because that pressure, uh, due to different uh, uh, speed, we can, we can get that. OK, we can get that. So it's called, uh, it's called dynamic pressure. Okay. Uh, don't believe that the pressure is a consequence of, uh, of a speed. Some people really understand in opposite way. The speed is due to the pressure difference, right? But either way, it's correct, I believe. You cannot say who is the cause, who is the effect at this point. Okay. All right. Uh, so. You heard about that in many of the large drones, they may have a pit -up and tube, pit up tube, OK? Pit up tube. Yeah, actually, in our aircraft, in, uh, in our uh, MESA lab, the fixed wing UAVs will usually have that pit up tube, OK? So you will be able to uh, use this instrument to infer what is the pressure, the air pressure. So the idea actually is very clear. Okay, so this is the nozzle uh, pointing to the aircraft direction. So then you have uh, uh, p and rho and v. We hope we will be able to infer the speed. Okay, infer the speed. Okay, infer the speed. How fast the aircraft is flying? Excuse me. What they did is by trying to infer uh, there are two types of uh, uh, chamber, OK? One is inside of the yellow one called static pressure, P sub s. One is this white chamber that was P sub t uh, is dynamic pressure, OK? Uh, sorry, total pressure, total pressure, P sub t. So then uh, if you have a difference of this one, this um, uh, called pressure transducer is like a, a diaphragm or it will, it will change. That change can be inferred from here, OK? Can be inferred from here. So then in other words, we will be able from this signal I'm pointing here, we'll be able to do this, OK? To do this. Then you divide it by the air uh, density, rho. 
By the way, the error density itself is also complicated. I'll explain in the next slide. So this row is a function of height, okay, and also temperature. Okay. So when we do this one, we have seen this before, and this is actually a Bernoulli's equation. Bernoulli's equation. So in the end, we find out v squared should be like this. So then, with this measurement, we are as if we are measuring the velocity. Okay. Velocity. So I hope this is somehow gave you an uh, application of this concept. So this dynamic pressure concept. Okay. This this is by simplification from uh, the simple Euler equation. This is simplified from the ultimate uh, full naval stocks equation. Okay. So we are going to move forward. So next, we are going to explain anything linked to the road, the atmosphere. Okay. So atmosphere. So pressure, temperature, density, they are correlated. So how they are related. So there is an interesting thing. is called the 1976 standard day model of atmosphere. Okay. So it's like this. It's like this. So uh, air is a uh, gas uh, like 78% uh, nitrogen, 21% oxygen. Others are just other CO2 and water and so on and so forth. So here, a sea level static standard day value for the density, okay, mass over volume is kg over uh, meters cube, okay. Uh, this is a British uh, units uh, we are using today, but uh, most of you know literature they use SI standard of international units. So you you can you can convert you can convert, but density is uh, specific volume and pressure, temperature, and viscosity. Viscosity is called mu. It's force time divided by area, okay? We're going to elaborate this one. We're going to elaborate this one. So <clears throat> different height, different temperature. So we need that kind of atmosphere model. What is that model? So when the height is greater than uh, this number, <laughs> okay, like 82,000 uh, feet, okay, yeah, feet. And then the upper stratosphere, and in this bracket is lower stratosphere, less than 36,000 is uh, troposphere, troposphere. So you can see the temperature is proportional to edge, is the height. The pressure is complicated um, function. It's a very uh, complicated function like that. So with different, uh, different uh, formula with different formula. So at a different height, uh, then we probably less than what's called troposphere. So we probably do very uh, slow, very low. So we are here. So atmosphere modeler a simulator. There is an online website. You can check where wh what is your height. So you slide and borrow how fast you move. They will, they will tell you what is the temperature, everything else you can get from here. So, but what is usually, what is the usual, if I use this one? So, in here, that is uh, temperature, that is uh, pressure, that is density. So these are, axis is like this. But here is the attitude. So from, from, ground to very high, okay, in terms of Km, okay. So then you can see very low, the higher, then the temperature is lower, and pressure is also lower, and uh, uh, speed of sound is also lower, uh, density is also lower, so it's going, going down, so from big to small, big to small, so as you go high, at some point, at some point, it will be different. They change differently. See, density, pressure, temperature, speed of sound. So, but we really need a model. 
we really need a model to tell all the slopes in here, the functions in here. So that's why we have this strange, uh, uh, by different segments, you have different functions. So this is exactly what we are trying to do this way. Okay? This way. So with that, you will be able to do some simulation. Okay? You are in flying in a different height. But for our small amen aircraft, like 400 feet, so you probably have a very fixed number. You change a few hundred feet, will not affect your air uh, atmosphere property. Okay? So almost constant. But you should know, uh, as an atmosphere, you should know that. So it's different height or different property. Okay? So in other words, in other words, you're using a Spitter tube. Uh, using the pitot tube in here, so this row will be different at a different height. So the speed should consider that factor. Uh, I have a story to share with you. Um, you I, I, before I moved here, I was in Utah, and uh, the elevation is about 5,000 feet okay, in the Rockies. Um, so we practice our flies and everything is just fine. But when we go to um, Maryland Air Force Base uh, to do the competition, things are very different. Because the air is denser. Okay, because we are high, so air is not as dense. And it turns out that the the the, the motor, the push is much harder. So something should be adjusted. Uh, we didn't realize that until we learned from our lesson. So, so then the air density is really a important issue. Okay, important issue. So we can, uh, uh, we will come back to this one and we can move, 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 move here. So next, so we got understanding about Aerodynamics, what is this? Why is it important? How hard it is? We start with the simple never stack stocks equation to understand the mass, continuity, conservation of momentum, conservation of mass, okay? And conservation of energy, okay? Energy. But that we, we have a, a simplification, simplification, and then gain more insights. With that, we can understand nicely about the principle of pitot tube. Pitot tube can be used to infer what is the speed relative to the air. Uh, to air. Okay, you, air is blowing like this. I move this way, so I will understand my what is my exact uh, the the speed. Okay, speed. Um, so next. Let's talk about moving through the air, uh, atmosphere. Okay, through atmosphere. So, um, so then uh, we have aircraft and uh, we have air. There's a relative motion. Okay. So then we should understand what are the forces on the aircraft. So then basically we are trying to understand what is drag, lift, and also momentum. Okay. So that is the aircraft. Okay. It's moving and air is blowing. It is saying that uh, so air is aircraft is static, parked in here. Uh, blow the air is the same as air is not move moving and aircraft is moving like that. So it's kind of relative motion. So I hope this is so simple. But okay, so you have wind speed. The wind is also carrying this aircraft. Okay. So, uh, so, so there are different speed. So, pitot tube will be able to detect this speed. Okay. So, but however, from ground people standing here, they will see, oh, this is a ground speed. Okay, ground speed. So you need to use ground speed minus wind speed to have your air speed. So, you, if you use ground as your reference. Okay. So the wind is not easy. Uh, 
to uh, measure depending on what reference frame, what <coughs> reference you are talking about. Okay? So with that, your aircraft may not be flying so straight like that. So you may fly past is like this, fly past, and your wind is blowing this one, up, draft, okay? So then you have a vertical, uh, the speed is like horizontal airspeed, vertical airspeed. So when we see airspeed, we say the airspeed of the aircraft itself relative to the wind, okay, relative to the wind. So the vertical wind uh, velocity, vertical velocity is wind speed, okay, the wind speed plus the vertical airspeed. So this is kind of vector sum. And you also have uh, angle alpha in here. This is called gliding angle. Uh, so the black, black line is called flight path, flight path, okay? And remember that you have uh, uh, the nose pointing to the exact same thing to the flat path. That's probably not usually the case. Okay, we'll see soon. Um, in many cases, uh, we um, have something called similarity parameters. Um, this one is we need to make a model aircraft to put into the wind tunnel so that we do tests in the wind tunnel. But how we can trust those? So there's something called similarity. So the similarity is uh, like uh, viscosity, uh, is uh, stickiness of the air, uh, and the compressibility is the springless, spring, springiness. So then uh, what are the parameters characterizing the viscosity? How sticky it is and how springy it is? So the unit here is renal uh, density times velocity times length divided by viscosity coefficient, something like this. And this one is the flow velocity divided by speed of sound. So the A usually is used to describe the uh, speed of sound. The V is the flow velocity. So I hope you already heard about the Mach number, okay? Mach number, okay? Mach number. So M Mach, this uh, Mach number is velocity divided by sound speed is dimensionless, dimensionless. So if, how, if somehow you can maintain these two numbers, Vila number and Mach number are the same. Okay? Then we say that uh, you basically you are doing something similar. Okay? Okay? It's under the matched flight conditions. Okay? So these, fa these similarity parameters are important. Again, Vila number, Mach number. These are very fundamental. So then this is uh, A, is called speed of sound. We should understand what is the speed of sound. So uh, speed of sound will propagate in the air, okay? So it is a square root of gamma RT. Gamma is uh, specific heat. Uh, then gas constant for air, this is a, so it's basically the link to the temperature, okay? Link to the absolute temperature, okay? absolute temperature. Uh, this, so this is uh, the speed of sound, speed of sound. So again, if we say uh, the Mach number is less than one, is called subsonic. Uh, greater than one is supersonic. And uh, then if greater than five is called hypersonic. You heard about ultrasound, right? Ultrasound. Ultrasound probably is somewhere there, okay? And, but anyway, uh, transonic is something in between, okay? It's in between. So those jet, this is a fighter jets, is hypersonic. 
I also, uh, this is uh, probably uh, supersonic uh, for the aircrafts, mainly in the military. But for the uh, subsonic level, it's uh, for the civilian uh, airliners. airliners. So we, we have seen this uh, similarity parameters. Let's do uh, um, some understanding about it. So how the viscosity and compressibility will influence our aerodynamics, OK? So one of the important discovery and concept <coughs> is called boundary layer, OK? You haven't learned aerodynamics, you can see in aerodynamics, boundary layer is a very important concept. So, so the idea is, if you have a <coughs> surface of uh, something, okay, then you have a, a sp the wind is moving. So, then you will see there's a gradient in here. And then after a while, uh, cross the boundary layer, then you have a free stream. Okay. So this is called boundary layer. Okay. Boundary layer. So if you have, um, so, so, so this is called laminar flow, laminar flow, if you go very slowly. But if you go a little bit faster than the threshold, it will become turbulent. Uh, it become turbulent. So visually speaking, uh, it's something like this. So you have an uh, airfoil, OK? So you fly. So you have air, uh, this airflow, flow lines, OK, flow lines. So if you. If you have an angle, this is your flight path. So you are flying this way versus this way. So you have something produced in here is very turbulent, very turbulent. Then at certain angle, at a certain angle, so so you, you need air, you need this to have certain angle to be able to lift it up. But if you too too heavy lift, so you, the angle is too big. So this is an interesting curve. So this is x-axis angle of attack in here. So the flat pass versus your the, the, the your body axis. So uh, so this is also called chord. Okay, chord. Flat path and chord angle is called angle of attack. Okay, angle of attack. So a small angle of attack, then you have a lift in here. Lift generated, y axis lift, lift generated. But after a while, if you have too big an alpha, then you suddenly lose your lift, will not go up anymore, suddenly go down. That's called stall. You, want, you don't want that. That stall will result in crash. And I have I've seen so many cases like that in our previous tests. Okay? So, but remember, when the angle of attack is zero, meaning I just, the cord and my flat pass are the same, OK? So then, when it is zero, they still have some kind of lift generated. It's not like, when this is zero, this is also zero. No. There's an inherent lift generated. Why? That's because of the foil, because of the, foil, the shape of the wind. So this foil design, it is also very important. Okay, and there's a, there's a reason we we need to put the wing the section like this foil shape. Okay. Well, let's define the different parts of the aircraft. Then we focus on our wing. Because it's the wing that produces the lift to make it stay in the air and fly. Okay? Without that, no matter how big is your um, pro propeller, no matter what else, the sophisticated GPS or other pilots, it's not going to work. You cannot lift it up, right? So you have to produce lift. So the wing is to produce lift. So to study aerodynamics, the most important thing is to understand the lift and also drag. Okay, okay. Drag 
determines how, how long you can fly in the air. Lift is like whether you can be in the air. Okay? So, so this is a typical aircraft and functions. So usually you have cockpit, command and control inside here, fuselage is a body and they hold things together and carry payloads like your luggage or the food, okay? Drinks. Jet engine generates thrust, slats to change the lift, there's some slats. Spoiler in here, change lift drag and roll, all of them, okay? Aileron is in here, change the roll. And this is flaps to change lift and drag. So sometimes you want to do some trade-off. So when you in the air, uh, in the aircraft, you watch here the changing where it's landing and takeoff is change. It changes. The generated lift, the wing, the uh, main, the wing is generated the lift. A horizontal stabilizer is to do the control the pitch. It's horizontal. And uh, vertical stabilizer is control the is control the yaw. The rudder in here change the yaw to do side by side. So this is called also called elevator. Okay, uh, elevator. So you change the pitch at up and down. Up and down is pitch yaw pitch yaw. So <laughs> yaw pitch yaw. I hope you you it will will emphasize this one later. Your roll, roll, pitch, yaw. Okay. So the aircraft is roll. This is a roll. Pitch is like this. Yaw is like this. If 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 this aircraft had roll is like this. Pitch is like this, up and the yaw is like this. Okay, so roll pitch yaw. So because we this module we are learning aerodynamics, so we just focus on the wing. <coughs> focus on the wing. If you look from this angle, you will see the wing actually is something like this. You do a section of it. So this one is uh, uh, the wing. So, but if you if you look in a in the top view, the wing is like this. It's like a rectangle. Okay, let me do this. So it's somehow like a rectangle. Okay. So the wind geometry definition is like this. Okay. So it could be symmetric, uh, and also the wing put into the. This is the front view. Okay, from the front of the aircraft. You see, the wing is not like this. It's actually tilted a little bit up. So this is called a like dihedral. Angle. This is important. We learn the hard way in the previous way. We put the wind like this. It's not working. We have to be a little bit like this. So it, there's a dihedral angle. It's a very small angle. Okay, by the way. Okay. Uh, so this is cord line. This thickness chamber, mean chamber. Uh, I'm sorry, mean camber. Okay, camber line. This is a camber. Airfoil is uh, this is wing area. This is span. This is cord. So uh, this chord uh, with span uh, is called aspect ratio, AR. The last question is called aspect ratio. It's S divided by C. S span divided by chord. Span divided by chord is aspect ratio for rectangle. Okay, and also you can use uh, this uh, uh, S square divided by the overall overall area of the surface, so it's also okay. So this is called wind plat platform, wind platform, like this. This is a trailing edge is in the back, leading edge is front, leading edge, so it go back. So this is a leading edge, this is a trailing edge, okay? In the back, in the, in the, in the back or in the front. Okay, mm. so then we try to understand what is uh, uh, the drag, what is the drag. So in terms of drag, the drag curve is usually like this. 
uh, well, you have Mach number. Okay, this is a one. Is subsonic. So this, you can see the drag. Usually, you can imagine that the faster you go, then your drag is bigger, right? So it's true. Faster you go, the, your drag is bigger. So this is a drag. But when your speed is less than certain threshold, like here, then the drag doesn't matter how fast you go. The drag is like that. Okay, it's almost constant. So in very low speed, subsonic, so it's not going to create difference between drag. Of course, this is not zero though. Huh. Okay, a constant. But then, during the transition of sonic way, uh, the, uh, s the speed of sound, so there's a rapid changing here. So that's why the sudden changing here is also called a sound barrier. You need to overcome very sudden increase of the drag. Okay? Then it will go down and the supersonic side is actually going s uh, slower, uh, smaller. As you go fast, my speed is, uh, my drag is even small, smaller. Isn't this interesting? Yes, it is true. Very interesting, actually. Okay? So the drag conversion is something like this, and go that, something like that. And you have a high uh, critical Mach number. After that, then you will go down. Okay, you will go down. So, so let me go back and show you. So, so you understand that using this type of uh, airfoil, the different shape of the airfoil, the curve will be different. Okay, and. Uh, so this slide is the work I have done before. I have done before. So basically, you have, uh, this is my work, uh, almost 30 years, no, 20 years ago. 20 years ago. <laughs> so basically, uh, you have uh, uh, something, uh, so you, you launch something, it's not clear, this one. So basically, something like this. So you have, um, So you have a, a place you launch the cannon. So this, you shoot, then you launch, you, you land, okay? So, but uh, the object, so I put a stage in here, try to use the Doppler radar to track onto it. So if you move, they will track you, okay? They will track you. So they will return waves, okay? So then I understand what is your speed. What's your speed? So this one is called tracking radar. Okay, tracking radar. And based on the tracking radar information, so can I recover the CD, the, the, the coefficient? The answer is yes. So compare this, this is a, a the, the peak point is corresponding to Mach number one. And uh, so you can see, I go back. So basically from this section. So I recovered the real data from here. And then you can see there's a dotted line that is a, a wind tunnel experimental results. So I, I extracted this from the real data over some noise. It's okay. And that's really nice. Directly identified from the radar measured velocity data. It's called dynamic fitting approach. Dynamic fitting approach. So just to let you know that um, I played this one a long time ago. So this, so when I see this one, I feel at home. Oh, it's an old friend. Okay. So then uh, we need to understand how aerodynamic forces are generated. So we need to go through at least another few slides. We can uh, take rest another 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, what creates aerodynamic forces? Aerodynamic forces uh, are exerted by airflow comes from two sources, the pressure and the shear stress. So the two sources, two sources, okay? 
So then the pressure and shears are the units of force per unit square. So it's Newton per square meter. So these are the number. So 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 these are the two reasons, two root causes of having aerodynamic forces. So you should not only understand like, oh, it's only pressure difference that I have force. That's not true. That's not true. Okay. So there's also a shear stress difference. So the stress in here and stressing up and down will be different. The stress difference will produce the so how the aerodynamic forces are generated. So how many aerodynamic force? I would like to say only one, okay? The only one force due to aerodynamics. We'll, we'll justify why I say that way, only one. Okay? So no matter how complex the flow field and no matter how complex shape of the body, the only way nature has of uh, communicating an aerodynamic force to the solid objects or surface is through the pressure and shear stress distribution. The distributions exist on those surfaces. So the pressure and the shear stress distributions are the two hands of nature from the nature that reach out and grab the body, insert the force in the body, and that's aerodynamic force. Okay, so aerodynamic force. Then we project the force into different frames. Then we can differentiate these different components as either lift or drag. Okay. So you don't tell people that oh, there are two aerodynamic forces on the aircraft when it's flying in the air. No, that's not not a correct statement. You only have one aerodynamic force. They project in the different directions. We have different components. So let's see this one. So we resolve those, the force, resolve that. So, um, so say for example, uh, you have a, a rel so relative wind is a direction V uh, infinity. We use this notation, okay? We use uh, superscript infinity to indicate the upstream condition. Upstream condition. So this is upstream condition V infinity is the wind like that, so we move like this, so relative to wind, okay, and then we have one R, this is called total aerodynamic force, there's only one total aerodynamic force. So we resolve it uh, into two directions, one is called lift L and drag D, okay, drag D, perpendicular to the relative wind, that's called uh, lift. Parallel, this is drag. So it's, it's not hard to understand. But anything we talk is relative to wind, okay? So listen, uh, look at this one. So you have wind blowing this way and you are flowing this direction, but your actual flight path is this way. So, but you intend to fly this way. So that's the real situation. They blow you away from your path. So in the in the, in the next uh, next next week, I'm going to explain to you those navigation parts. So that's the real understanding. Okay, the wind blowing this one off the de intended or desired flight path. So you detect, then you should go back. That's that's past planning and past uh, following control. Okay, control. So then, uh, you have a wind and you have actual flight like that, so your, your head is never actually aligned with the flight path. There's always an angle in here that's called angle of attack, okay? Angle of attack. So we're going to see that, I'm going to see that. So, so let me go back a slide to highlight one single word. It's called distribution. <coughs> Distributions, okay, distribution. So let me use this one to show you distribution. So the total aerodynamic force on oil force is a summation of force one or two. The one is uh, lift is obtained when F2 greater than F1. 
Uh, and the misalignment of F1 and F2 will create momentum. Okay? Momentum. Will automatically turn tumbling. Okay? So, uh, the value of the induced moment depends on the point about which the moments are taking. So, so the F1 due to the distribution in here, okay, distribution here. There are t uh, I told you there are two sources. One is the distribution of, one is the distribution of pressure, one is the distribution of the shear, okay? So then they will produce different forces. If they are not aligned, okay, so they will produce some sort of some sort of mom mom momentum, okay? So this momentum is called aerodynamic momentum. Aerodynamic momentum, okay? We're going to go through that later. But um, this, the, actually, there are four things. Uh, three things be important. So one is lift, uh, one is drag, another one is the aerodynamic momentum, okay? Moments for an airfoil wind change as alpha changes. So variation of these quantities are important information for airplane designers. So then, uh, so aerodynamic center versus gravity center, they are totally different thing, okay? So point about uh, which moments essentially do not vary with alpha. So when alpha changes, so you do not have change. So in this case, uh, aerodynamic center, the moment is a constant, independent of alpha, okay? So low speed air for aerodynamic center is near the quarter chord point, C over four, C over four. So let's see some of those um, ideas. So you have a bullet, is this bullet? No, no, don't say this is a bullet, it's an airfoil, okay? So you can see that uh, laminar flow and boundary layer is so clear. Is it clear? So this is an angle of attack of two degrees. It's so very small. So if I do it three degrees, you will see the 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 the, the trailing uh, vortices are different. Okay. If you do four degrees, you can see they start to have turbulence. Okay. Six or uh, six degrees. And 90 degrees is even worse, so even worse, 90 degrees. Now we'll see 12 degrees, then we'll see 20 degrees, and now even worse, 60 degrees. <laughs> but if we do 90 degrees, okay? Okay, so you just, so the flow, visual, this is called flow visualization. It's different, okay? So I'll go back. We'll see from beginning. One. So I hope you can have appreciation that this curve is real. Okay, is a real. So the angle of attack, that angle, um, will be. Uh, let's talk about symmetric airfoil. So you can because it's symmetric. So when angle of attack is zero, then the lift is also zero, okay? But you will have this cross zero here. So then you have store uh, something like this. So you got a rough idea, okay? So with different angle, okay? But if you have unsymmetric, it's called a, a cambered airfoil. Cambered airfoil is like this. So that's why you see our aircraft airfoil is never, it is never symmetric like this. No, no way, it's not. So it has to be something like this. So that when angle of attack, I like, uh, if I'm, I'm doing, uh, aircraft is doing uh, uh, the flight in a steady, and it should be always flat. So our flight will be zero. But still, you need lift to 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 keep it in the air. So in that case, in that case, symmetric uh, airfoil will need you to keep this one. In that, in, in other words, 
uh, when the aircraft in the middle of the air, they got, when they do cruise, they, they must be doing like this, so every customer is not very confident, right? They are slow, right? So, so that's why we need something like this. So this type of uh, airfoil and symmetric one will create lift when alpha is even zero, okay? Okay? So again, they also have this uh, um, or store angle. Okay. So then, uh, so let's do a summary. Uh, so there are some sample data. So, so this is what we really actually need. So store due to the flow separation start to produce a lot of drag. Okay, and then then lift is de decreased. So you have an idea here. So this symmetric will cross to zero. Uh, so let's summarize. Lift coefficient or lift linear variations with respect. So it's a linear. So D uh, lift, uh, DCL, D alpha is a lift slope. It's a constant. The symmetric airflow have zero lift when alpha is zero. High enough angle of attack perform of airfoil will rapidly degrade that induce the store. So in the store, uh, we need to have understanding about um, what is really going on here, OK? So what is store, and can we predict it? Can we design for it? So the answer is yes. It is none. OK, it is none. Uh, I think we, we, we are covering too many concepts, are we? But I think it's. So far, not, nothing really hard to understand. Let's, let's do a little bit more, and then we'll uh, take a break, OK? So let's finish this one about the reality. In reality, we ignore in the previous the viscosity, stickiness of uh, the air. So what if uh, the stickiness is different, OK? So, um, so the actual airfoil wind behavior we need to understand. So to, to the real world, Things not like this. This is we ignoring a lot of factors. So now we are talking about uh, uh, viscosity. So, so the real flow always have some frictions. So uh, frictionless flow around the body will result in zero drag. So, so it must include the friction in the theory. Uh, so in aerodynamics, we first produce the idea of lift. Uh, because of this uh, distribution difference, you have lift. But actually, we haven't talked about uh, the friction, so we should talk about it. So uh, the presence of friction in the flow causes a shear stress at the surface of a body, which in turn contributes to the aerodynamic drag of the body. It's called skin friction drag. What's that? Let's visualize it. Okay. So, so if you do not have friction, okay, so then you don't have this kind of boundary layer, okay. In real life, the thickness of the boundary layer, okay. So this is the wing, okay. This is the the profile of so, uh, uh, airfoil. So the thickness of the boundary layer is greatly overemphasized for clarity here. So it actually, it's very small. But we are trying, just trying to help you to understand it. But in reality, it's something like this, OK? So it's viscous boundary layer flow. So when you have store, uh, it's uh, also a viscous phenomenon. And flow away from here is flow away from airflow is not influenced by friction. So it's called invisible. OK, so let's have a closer look. So you will enlarge a lot. You will see in the surface of foil. So then you have velocity profile through the boundary layer. So this profile is also predictable, OK? Predictable through the boundary layer. So in the real life, it's like that. OK, so here are some equations. Then we'll see uh, what's the difference, OK? So this fixing about renal number to quantify the uh, viscosity. Um, one of the most important dimensionless, this is a dimensionless number in fluid mechanics and aerodynamics called renal number. 
So rho v infinity, this is free flow, here in the front, okay? Inertial force, viscous force, C is the length scale, chord, length scale, okay? Renal number tells you when viscous force are important and when viscous, viscosity may be neglected, okay? Neglected. So the BL stands for boundary layer. So outside the boundary layer, we consider this is flow without friction, uh, without friction. Invisit is a uh, high renal number, okay? So in here, it's called boundary flow with highly viscous, low renal number inside in here. So the renal number is different. So now, okay, now, laminar versus turbulent, I have already told you, okay? The boundary layer transition from laminar to turbulent, there's a transition, so, okay? This profile is different when the speed is different. So finally, you can see that this is the velocity, this is the uh, y uh, axis, so what's the shape? So the shape should be laminar like this, a turbulent will be like this, okay, like this, okay. So then the friction, ver the variation of the skin friction coefficient with the renal number uh, for low speed flows. So the, this is the renal number, uh, laminar turbulent. So this is friction, laminar is fr small friction. Turbulent, uh, it can be uh, at the same renal number, turbulent is much bigger, okay? okay? So this is always true, always true, okay? So let's see some uh, flow separation uh, uh, animation, then we we'll take a break. So this is something, uh, understanding the friction course, course is a flow separation uh, within the boundary layer. Separation then creates another form of drag, it's called pressure drag due to separation. So when you drive your car, and in the back of your car, the pressure is lower. That difference of the pressure causes your drag, okay? So if you somehow uh, you can uh, fill up the, the, the back of your air uh, with enough pressure, then your car will move faster, okay? Uh, so which is true, okay? But it's expensive if you do that. Like you put in a rocket propeller, <laughs> generate the gas, you know, fill this. So this, the pressure here and here, they will be different. This, this pressure here and here is different. So you have a kind of difference. Okay. Otherwise, if everything, so pressure here and pressure here is the same, right? So, but here is small. So, so key to understanding this one is friction causes flow separation within boundary layer like this. All boundary layers will, can be uh, turbulent boundary layers. Uh, so anyway, separation creates another form of drag called pressure drag due to separation. So this is pressure drag. Um, uh, it's a dramatic loss of uh, lift and an increase in drag. Let me share with you uh, something um, I learned a long time ago. So um, you know that um, so the cannon shell is something like this, right? So uh, you shoot it, it will say uh, 20, k, 20 km, okay? You shoot that cannon uh, projectile. But somehow people invented ways to, uh, to, to release gas it's not propelling gas, it's just to fill this, uh, just release the gas so that to fill this area to increase the pressure, increase one. This is called base bleed technique. Technique, base bleed technique. That can e that can extend the, extend the range of the shell, say for example. So you didn't do much, but you just try to arrange some of the gas release in here with proper calculation about how much. So they will be able to extend the range, okay? Extend the range. That's a very good idea. 
that's exactly the to attack this problem. The difference is between the front and the end, front and the end. So the pressure here is small. This is big, so they create the, the drag due to the <coughs> pressure difference. So, okay, summarize of the viscous effect on drags. There are two. One is the skin friction itself due to the shear stress at all the surface, and the pressure drag due to the difference of the front and end. So, so, so total drag due to the viscous effect is called profile drag, okay? Due to skin friction and due to the separation. And so all these things are linked to the wing profile, different profile or different properties here. So, so how do you design dependent case by case basis? No definite answer. So that's a very sad news. That's why aerodynamics itself is an independent rocket science. Okay, ish. So you have to design based on some tools. You have to verify it by either wind tunnel or do flight tests. So I think we can take a break about 10 minutes, coming back um, 11.05. Okay, so uh, we'll continue the discussion about the aerodynamics, drag, lift, and the real world properties. Okay, so we we'll stop it here. Take a break. Okay, take a break. Um, you probably received an e uh, email regarding. Everybody should pass the RC. You should do some RC training. Then we give you we give you a certificate. That cert certificate file with a unique art. <laughs> well, we are going to sign. I'll sign for it. I'll hire a Motas to help you guys to practice to certify you are a good RC. So with that PDF file, keep it. So show, oh yeah, actually I went through this process. I can do remote control. <laughs> Only you pass that RC control practice, you can do the nets. So to fly our Intel drone. The Intel drone is uh, actually pretty expensive. So I don't want you to crash it without any RC experience. Okay, do some takeoff landing, takeoff landing, flying. Question? Do you have any more of the quiz? Where is the quiz here? I think we have enough. No, I actually have a copy Can you put the rest of the quizzes here? Okay, very good. Wow. Get out and warm up a little bit. It's RC. Agriculture. You mean the, the demonstration and those panels? Oh, okay. You want to use the classroom time? No, we have very limited classroom time. I need to cover this. But otherwise, how can you say you learn a UAS? You don't have a very clear idea of basic concepts of aerodynamics. So, yeah, I'm thinking about having him to introduce one hour of um, a precision agriculture application given our view. Uh, that's next step. I'm, I'll schedule him and he will definitely do it. Yeah. So, thank you for the uh, feel the demo day. <laughs> yeah, it went so well. Yeah. I, I, I saw you guys interview the, the reporter from Japan. Uh, Eva, Eva, Eva interviewed. No, no. The lady interviewed me and others. 
but our ag tech team here interviewed that interviewer. See what I mean? Uh huh. Out of all the news agencies, why NBC? I don't understand. They, they pursued me like two months ago, wants to come over here and do a report. I keep pushing back, I'm busy, you know, because they are coming from Japan, I thought. But it turns out they have a Los Angeles <laughs> station, so they send a crew that day. So I said, oh yeah, it's a good idea. If you want, you can go there and we can get together. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty unique experience for them as well. It's in the heart of the agriculture. So it's a very convincing. What would, what would they seek to learn from that? Then that is the message that and the farmers are now looking at drone as an option. And it makes sense and they have an aging population. Uh, so there, there's an increasing cultural and workforce trend towards automation. So makes I, sense. Be, <laughs> yeah, thank you. That, that's, overall that's a good angle. Yeah, that's everything from uh, hospitals to <laughs> yeah. agriculture, all that. That's a good point. That's a good point. Because I, yeah, because I think they have a negative growth rate right now, and I think it's supposed to fall below like 100 million by 2050, and they're 130 right now. So that's that's, mm -hmm. that's a population loss of 30 million over 40 years. Mm -hmm. So weird. I don't know. I mean, hasn't America also, like, hasn't America also kind of seen this like decline in birth rate? Yes, but that's offset by immigration. Why does no one immigrate in Japan? Because Japan actually has pretty strict immigration policy. <laughs> Hey, you guys need to get out and warm up a little bit. <laughs> you don't have to uh, always sit like this, you know. Uh, it's allowed to stand, you know. <laughs> All right, Thank you. This YouTube channel is fantastic. Did you post our group photos, three photos I gave to you? Do it today. Yeah. I can do it, but I prefer you. Yeah, it's, yeah, I, I did some massage of, of the texts of the yeah, channel. Uh, yeah. And also some of those uh, clips you can associate with a name, your name. Also. If the viewers wants to know more, they send you a, an email and, uh, or send a check to you. <laughs> it's consulting. It's serious. But if you don't have a name and email, then if they 
people are sometimes willing to pay to learn. It's called consulting. I mean, they, Get something I mean, interesting uh, out. Does that okay. with their you have a lot of things to tell the world, right? I would like to see one of those is for your keyboard. Five people <laughs> in the space. I want to learn more, actually. Like the yeah. yeah, think about it. Mm -hmm. It's not to be and like a scripted yeah, very seriously. You know, just so, you know, kind of like the casual the introduction to, and to yeah, make people and wonder is. and make people. Well, that's like they're impressed. both solving the same problem. One is that that's of enough. Getting or rid of the follow a link to a small. Getting rid of the first stage and yeah. using this kind of again using the second stage. Space like propaganda. <laughs> and I hope we can use this channel to attract next cohort. So good job. So I think the Professor Sun will love to watch all of them one by one. He's on the trip will come back very soon. But uh, I will take care of the middle and three weeks. So I'm hoping that uh, we will have some clear deliverables. Like as a group, we have 10 pages a week, 30 pages of writing. All those things can be shared. Put your name on There's the author. Okay. Join the author. Okay. The arrow class. Uh, I mean, still in. Let's do that. Yeah, to learn a little bit. Always the, think uh, about, oh, I spend time, I should be able to deliver something. Like, oh, can you guys check your uh, there, car is working? But it was like, can, can it you was check this the one? basics, like, if the wind's going this way, I which I a long time ago. Oh, like just yeah, let's see okay. if they can work. Because, uh, yeah, because, like, finding, yeah. like, the sheer stresses. Can you check your car is the, working? Uh, Oh, the mm -hmm. airfoil doing the labs. No, is it working here or up there? No, my car doesn't work there. It works like the there. You try it? Then I was just like, uh, you try it today? Much more involved with those. So the air space, the, what kind of place let's, let's do an experiment. Fly. Who do you have to contact? Like, if you had a flounder this flounder, who would you have to contact? It takes time, it takes time. So, uh, okay. what radio you're flying from to and stuff. That's the one thing. Or not yet, not yet. Yeah. Can you guys try so as yours are working? I mean, there's also stuff. Mine's inside. Policy. So, can you try whether yours work in side. there? Yeah. Uh huh. After you try it, I'm going to chase the guy no, one more time. <laughs> Unless you have a special waiver. No, they are also well, busy. Yeah. It's basically like a drive. Not working? There's a study. Yeah. yeah. Pretty good. It is working. FAA and 3D. Works for you? Yeah. Interesting. It's just a Eva, can you do one? That means he worked for me. Thank you. It's very strange. Thank you. Ah, still the same. Okay, I'll, I'll send them. They should do this way. Okay. Now it's working. Let's get started. We have, we are, we are in the middle, okay? We have uh, totally 120 slides, so we are in the 60s, okay? So, again, I'm trying to explain to you the drag, okay? And the drag, when we consider viscosity, the 
then uh, there's two effects, friction versus pressure, OK? So let me show you this. So this is a basketball, right? <laughs> so you have a flow in here. You can see lots of turbulence in here. And so the relative drag force is that direction, separation of the flow like that. So and then if you have this slender, uh, this is a kind of bore. It's very bad. So the so the the relative drag force is is dominating. It's huge. But here you can see the relative the the so the majority of that is pressure due to the pressure difference. Okay. So this 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 uh, gray area is called skin friction. So skin friction is not dominating. But in this case, the pressure drag is is small, relatively speaking. But this one is skin friction drag. So I hope that gives you appreciation why we need uh, the, the airfoil design. So that will give you different, the, the pressure drag will be small, will be small. So that's one I'd like that. Let me see one more. Um, so, so that's uh, for the case. Um, okay, well, give me a second. So, let's take a look of this one. The understanding of this one can actually save a lot of money. Okay, let me give you an example. Okay, so if you don't have anything in here, so you have truck spoiler example like this. So messy turbulent flow patterns, very high drag. So the fuel efficiency is not as high. It's not as high. But however. Somehow people can uh, design, okay, design uh, the aircraft like that. So they put a little bit of spoiler angle increase this compared to this one increased five degrees. Then you can see the flow will be different, very different, more closely similar to a laminar flow. Okay, so this is already um, proven. So that actually for a Miami, New York route to do this uh, long distance truck, every year can save $10,000 in fuel because of that five degrees. OK? OK. So that's pretty impressive. OK? Pretty impressive. So aerodynamics for flies can apply to many other areas. So think about, so the science is efficiency. Okay. All right, let's move forward to understand lift drag and the moments coefficients, OK? So behavior of uh, lift and uh, drag and uh, moments depending on the angle of attack and uh, also velocity and attitude. Velocity and attitude. That's because the velocity V infinity, rho infinity, wing area, wing shape, viscosity and compressibility all linked to this lift, drag, and uh, uh, moments. Okay. So we use lower case c as a coefficient. L like lift, drag, and moments. C L C D C M. Okay. And we use lift written in terms of capital L is the force. Okay. Capital is the force. Then you have half of the rho v square. So remember, rho v square is what? Dynamic pressure. Remember, dynamic pressure. And S is your surface area, yeah, the wing area, wing area. Of course, the lift is proportional to the area size. So, and CL, okay, CL. CL is lift coefficient. It's aerodynamic coefficient of lift. See that way, okay. But on the other hand, the CO is actually the same thing as this. So this one is dynamic pressure. This is a surface. This is a lift. 
And again, the CL we have seen is a function of alpha. Actually, it's a function of Mach number and a function of Reynolds number as well. Okay, as well. So, <coughs> so as I said, similarity parameters are two. Yes, similarity parameters are two. So the real aircraft subject to the Mach number and the Reno number, if these two numbers are the same in here, Mach number and the Reno number is the same, then we can do the uh, this is called wind tunnel experiments to be reliably used as a real full model. So then the CL, CD, CM should be identical. The reason is because of that equation definition. Okay, so we are moving a little bit faster. Okay, so then lift drag and the moment coefficients. So we have seen that. Then let's write down. Okay, so this is a lift. Lift we have explained that. So it's a function of three things. So the other is also a function of these three things: angle of attack, uh, the free stream speed, Mach number, and the Reynolds number. Okay. So this one is the same. You only change C L C D C M. Okay. Uh huh. C M. But in here, we use lowercase for the infinite wing airfoil. Infinite wing. And capital C and as a finite wing. Finite wing. We'll, we'll explain what, what does that mean. OK? OK. So they all contains a half row V square. This is dynamic head. It's Q infinity. OK, Q infinity. All right, so let's see what, is, what does that mean. So there are so many designs of different types of airfoils. And at some certain period of time, being able to design airfoil and characterize it is, a, is an art. It's a very cutting edge, high tech work. And this axis is moment coefficient, OK? This axis is the. Uh, Section lift coefficient CL, so the moment is CM, okay, CM. So as we can see that the lift will go up, okay, it's linearly proportional to the alpha, different angle of that. So when zero is in here, so it's non-zero, okay. So it's not symmetric airfoil, okay. We can see that for alpha is zero, corresponding to Lift is not zero, so it's non-symmetric airfoil. If it is symmetric, it will be zero, right? So, and uh, so then uh, as alpha goes up, it goes up. At some point, it will uh, store. Okay, the lift will store. Will because of the separation, the laminar flow separation to transit to uh, transition to. Uh, turbulent flow, okay. So lift the work. So this is the moment. The moment is like constant. Then you, you you have the same thing like you store. Then the moment will drop as well, as well. So it's called moment coefficient, and uh, and this moment is pointing at the quarter chord position. It's called aerodynamic center, and. So uh, it's getting interesting. So I, I, I showed you that. So these are the situations here. So what about the real? These are the real wind tunnel data. X axis are of uh, Y axis is the C lift. Okay, the C C one independent of the Reynolds number. Okay, independent of the Reynolds number. But if you have a different Reynolds number, and uh, Uh, so this is a, a CM, is a aerodynamic moment, okay? And aerodynamic moment at the aerodynamic center versus lift, it should be, should be a constant. It should be a constant, okay? Yeah, it's called CM alpha versus C lift, okay? So lift. So it should be the constant like this. It's flat, okay? It's flat, and. 
uh, with different uh, with different renal number. Okay, different renal number. Okay, so it's not so influenced by the renal number. However, however, the CD versus CL is called drag lift curve. Drag lift curve. Then this will be affected by. Uh, it will be affected by the renal number in a significant way, uh, significant way, which is understandable when it is sticky, then drug is also big. Okay, drug is also big. So you have a bigger air lift. You have you, when it is sticky, you have bigger, bigger lift. Then you also have a bigger drug. Okay. So that's the renal number depend, dependence at the high angle of attack is very clear, different the renal numbers and the same. So CD versus RFI is dependent on the renal number. And so the, then that's why we have lots of uh, different flaps and slats. So you can see this is a small thing. They can extend a little bit when you take off configuration. When you do the landing configuration, it's uh, also different. So it's also different. They send this one to here and like that. Okay. So this will ch uh, change the characteristics okay, for the aircraft. So that explains that. So let me give you another idea. So uh, so you have wing cross sections like that. So you have a fixed leading edge wing slat, slat. It's like that. You have a, a flap along like that. It's kind of like a small. So when you do climbing, when you do cruising, so it will be different. Okay, it will be different. So that's exactly explains here. And so the following is a curve that shows you the flapping, extended, flap retracted. So they can see this uh, this uh, angle of attack, alpha. This is uh, one is a section of lift coefficient. So extended, the lift is much higher. OK? Much higher. And uh, again, uh, the pressure distribution versus the lift. So we should understand lift is coming from the pressure distribution over the top uh, and bottom. Okay, and bottom. So you can see this is a, there's a distribution of that. Then the total re, uh, end result is the lift. End result is the lift. So we have seen that. But the question is, the pressure coefficient for non-dimensional description, actual value of the pressure distribution aerodynamic literature also written as CP. Pressure distribution, okay. Pressure distribution. So, why do we care about distribution, okay? Okay. Because this distribution CL is the physical foundation for my lift coefficient, okay? So uh, let's 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 do it now. Let's do it. So uh, so we also understand what is the Mach number on this, how this changes, okay? How this changes. So and also corresponding to the wind tunnel data. Okay, it's much easier. So therefore, we introduce the free flow. The infinity is a free flow. Okay, free flow pressure and the real pressure. Then you do a coefficient of CP. It's called a pressure distribution coefficient, CP. And normalize it by this one, okay? Dynamic pressure. So that's sort of ratio. So usually, you can see the distribution CP in upper surface and uh, lower surface will be different. So the difference shows the lift. Shows the lift. So let's let's do that. So it's possible we can compute using some codes online. You can get it. So then you can a discrete has different points. Then this is the x-axis about the, the the distance here. Then the CP on different points you will have distribution like this. So you, according to that, okay. So with that, you will be able to have CP. Then you can draw the CP, not lift yet. The CP 
the difference of that, okay, and corresponding to my speed, uh, speed, uh, Mach number, Mach number. So it, you will see that it is intuitive that the faster you move, the bigger your lift is, right? Okay, the bigger. So then there are some um, points that, uh, because of the uh, not symmetric, so when you move very slow, you still have some lift. Okay. So these are the core coefficients. Okay, coefficients. So in this region, the Mach number is very small. It's usually our region is like that. So it's like, but when you have a transonic transition to that, it will be really good, really big, really big. So, so starting from this range, 0 0.4 to 0.8, the effect of compressibility is to increase the absolute magnitude of the CP. Okay, so that kind of increase of coefficient is very significant. Okay, very significant. So just this is a visualization. So you need to add them together. Then so you need to integrate. And then finally, you after you integrate everything, you got a lift net lift, okay? Then you can compute lift in terms of that, number of that, okay? Okay, number of that. So, so this is getting probably too much uh, technical details, but just to let you know that it technically is possible we can compute numerically about all this CL here. And so we need to discuss about um, finite versus infinite wing um, concept. We'll come back to that, or we'll come to that point soon. So let me do. So now critical, critical, this is this point. This is called critical point. So this is the axis x divided by c is a one, normalized to one. So this point, this point is the Mach number. Uh, this is there. And the Mach number is here. So So flow over the airfoil may have sonic raging, uh, even though the free stream is uh, less than a Mach number less than one, and so that actually increase our drag. Okay, increase our drag. So that explains this small separating air region. Okay, why that's true. Okay, and we have learned that. Okay. So this is trans. Okay. So this is uh, this uh, additional, additional critical flow there, and uh, but shock that shock wave. We probably, if we have uh, shock wave, meaning you have nearly to the Mach one here, then you have something, is called shock wave. So that will produce that distribution of your pressure. Okay. So that will increase your drag in a significant way, OK? So that, that explains using the pressure distribution. So let's visualize a little bit. So this is the first one is called uh, uh, Mach number is subsonic, subsonic, OK? And then uh, when you have a transition, you start to see a bubble of supersonic flow, supersonic flow, OK? And when you have uh, almost Mach 1, so then you have something here is called shock wave induced region. That region will in result in significant pressure difference, will give you a lot of drag. Okay? So, airfoil thickness summary will give you an idea. Okay? Uh, so, so why, which one is good? So which curve is the most lift? So thicker or uh, airfoil will create. Which has higher critical Mach number? The thinner one. 
So which is better? Okay, which is better? So that's also application dependent on what do you really want. Okay, so let me give you two World War One air airplane examples. Uh, one is called uh, English Sop with Camel, and it's a wing. Uh, the wing profile here is like this. It's a British RAF 14, British. So very thin wing, lower maximum uh, lift coefficient, bracing wires required for high drag, and with high drag, with high drag. So German Fokker 1 is like this. So the airfoil is something like this. So it's here, OK? So it's much higher maximum uh, coefficient, lift coefficient, a higher rate of climb, improved maneuverability. So you have seen this one often, huh? OK. So people may say, this is the cord lens, OK? This is the thickness. So when we use this ratio, is called aspect ratio. Okay, so sometimes they use a thickness to cord ratio trends. So this is uh, with different designs, different years, stuff uh, re revolving over time. So they put all the different designs of the airfoils. They see some st some trends. So thick, uh, streamwise thickness versus cord percentage. Okay, and this is a marker number. The Mach number. So the higher the Mach number, the lower the, thick, the, the, the thinner of the airfoil. So you can see this is much thin, and this is high. Okay, the thickness is this is thicker than this, right? So so you all fall in this region. Okay, this trend. So if you your design something is in here, something probably is wrong. Okay. But on the other hand, your design will not cross the Mach number 0.1. Uh, it probably is very, very small here. So, so again, let me just give you another appreciation. Boeing 737, uh, they have uh, something like this. Okay. There are lots of airfoils designs existing today. You can get this one here. Okay. Uh, there's a different Boeing types, okay? A different designs. All right, so let me summary of our um, airfoil. So again, uh, airfoil drag is due to actually um, friction pressure. We have explained that later on. We talk about uh, shock wave or transonic region, the bubble effects. So uh, uh, so for very low speed, you don't have this. Okay, So CDW, CDF, friction, pressure, and wave. So this too is called profile drag. Uh, and the profile drag relatively constant with Mach at a very subsonic. So, so that's why it's called profile drag. It's only dependent on your geometry, OK, geometry. And we have seen this curve multiple times. I hope you will memorize this. Because is, this is the Mach number. This is the drag coefficient. Okay, drag coefficient. Okay. But what about finite wing? Okay. So we used we used the finite wing versus the infinite wing. So a, a spectral ratio is b squared divided by s. Okay. B is the wind span. Uh, Wait. Uh, okay, speaking ratio. So infinite two-dimensional wings. They are assuming that the wing is. This is a. This is a. a the f the edge in the leading edge. This is trailing edge. Uh, so moving that direction. So we're assuming that this goes to infinite. So this is called infinite wind. Infinite wind. Uh, but in reality, we have finite wing. Okay, finite wing. So you have wingspan versus uh, uh, the cord. 
So this overall S is this wing area. The wingspan divided square up divided by S. So this is aspect ratio. So for high aspect ratio aircraft versus low aspect ratio of aircraft. So there are different uses, okay? Different uses. So <coughs> You, yes, you have an airfoil, meaning that the profile, okay, the profile determines your drag majority. And let me repeat, the profile. So that's why I call profile drag. So the profile. But now you talk about wind. How big is the wind? Okay, how big is the wind? So, uh, so because of the finite wind, it's not long infinitely. So at the edge here, you always have some sort of pressure difference. So upper surface is usually low pressure. Lower surface is usually high pressure. So that you have lift, OK? You have lift. And flow always desire to go from high to lower pressure. So that's true. So you always have this type of wind go this way, go this way. So let me visualize it for you. So uh, from high uh, pressure to uh, low pressure. So this is sometimes called down wash, down wash, okay? Down wash, okay? So then you can see that um, this is uh, very uh, clear. Uh, there isn't too much this uh, flying, but this one, you see they have some interactions. The wind blowing this way. So the wash this way is different. So, okay, different. And this is even worse, okay, even worse. <coughs> so they somehow they can stir the air like this one is called vortex wake, vortex, okay. For the down washing, we should understand a little bit further. Um, You can see this kind of downwash visualization, OK? So you have downwash. So you, you disturb the air uh, in, while you fly. So people say, if you have aircraft in here also flying and get into this downwash, it could be dangerous, OK? It could be dangerous. So that's all due to the finite wing effect finite wing impact. So in this case, you like Boeing 737, so you, you always have this kind of downwash effect. Effect. So yours uh, is conventional wind tip. But however, if you add a little bit windlet, small windlet, you can like this thing, OK? At a small, then you will see that its downwashing is not act that big. That will further increase the efficiency, reduce the drag, reduce the drag. <coughs> so the wind tip vortices include uh, induce a small downward component for air uh, velocity near wind by uh, dragging surrounding air with them. So downward component of velocity is called the downwash W. <coughs> so you have a downwash W here. So then so this is the local relative wind. Then you have this one. So tip vortex. Uh, so the consequence is the reduced uh, induced drag. Uh, this sometimes is also called drag due to lift. Uh, drag due to lift. So you need large lift. You need to go faster. To go faster, then you have a bigger this tip vortices. The angle of attack is effectively reduced as well compared with v infinity. Okay, v infinity. So because there is an angle, a chord line like this, so the angle will be different because of this component. Okay. So in this case, in this case, we should redefine the. Uh, this is geometrically the angle of attack is alpha, like that. OK? 
Okay. But however, because of the core line and the relative wing, so suppose you don't have this uh, wing tip, you didn't consider, so it's an infinite wing. It's an infinite long wing. So with, with that, the alpha should be modified. So, so in fact, it's not going this way, it's going this way. So the wind is not blowing this way. It's blowing this way because of what? <coughs> because of this component. Okay. So this is called alpha effective. So it will be smaller. Therefore, it sees locally. Okay. The angle between the local flow direction and the core line is what we call alpha effective. And alpha effective is uh, always smaller than the geometric because of the downwash. Okay, downwash. All right, so I, I think it's understandable. So this is alpha effective, alpha induced, and this is all positive numbers. Okay, and this can be checked in the uh, wind tunnel experiments. Okay. And the infinite wing description is like this. Uh, so we don't consider anything in here, okay? So relative wind, so this is like that. We don't have this uh, downwash component. So the left is always perpendicular to the relative wind, so the lift. So all the lift is balancing the weight, okay? But you, you have downwashing because of this alpha induced. So this is due to the finite wing effect. Finite wing effect physically will introduce the uh, induced vortices. That will uh, cause the downwash. Then that will be making uh, angle of attack smaller. Okay, so illustrated like that. Okay, I hope this is not hard to understand. Okay. So in this case, it's called finite wing description, and this is realistic. Okay, not so you have to consider that. So I think this is a starting uh, the same thing like this. So this interpretation is the same idea. So what we consider uh, when we cons when we consider those finite wing effect, so we usually will get. Smaller lift and large drag. The capital capital letter is uh, with finite wing. Small letter C is called infinite wind. Okay, infinite wind. It's because of this induced. So because alpha effective is always less than alpha, so the lift is smaller, but drag is actually bigger. Okay, drag is actually bigger. Very kind of interesting. But anyway, I, I think this is not hard to digest. And on the other hand, uh, the induced drag uh, sometimes can be approximated by proportional to the lift times alpha. Because when alpha is very small, usually it's very small, then uh, the sine alpha in here is alpha. So this is sometimes called drag. Uh, sorry, lift induced drag. Lift-induced drag. Okay. So then, with that, we can uh, we can talk about uh, drag has friction, pressure, and induced finite wing. Uh, or you can say uh, we have profile. Okay, profile drag and induced drag. All the drag, you can look up, doing lookup table, okay, lookup table, check this one. But this one, D sub i, capital D, calculated from inviscity theory, lift line theory. So this is also computable, okay? So in summary, uh, in different cases, we need to consider aspect ratio. So uh, we have seen this before. Okay, I've seen this before. So next is how to like, how to the estim estimate the induced drag. How? Okay. So calculation of this induced the the 
Hangover attack induced by the downwashing is not that easy. It's not that easy. So it depends the distribution. Okay, it depends the distribution. So let, let me quickly go through some of these slides for you. So that it, so basically we want to explain to you why in high speed fighter jets uh, they use very thin uh, low aspect ratio. Uh, why uh, this is a high aspect ratio, okay? Th that is c explainable by the induced drag distribution of the downwashing, okay? So these are the edge finite wing effect, okay? So then you can check the front, wing, front view of the wing, and uh, special case is uh, elliptical uh, lift distribution. Suppose it's just a uh, Elliptic, okay? Then we just, this is approximation, um, doing an elliptic wing. Then we do some computation to have some sort of insight for understanding. Uh, again, back to the situation here, why this is a low aspect ratio. So this will give you the answer, okay? Give you the answer. The key result using an elliptical lift distribution to give you the understanding why aspect ratio is uh, playing a role in here, okay? Playing a role in here. So the induced drag is lift times R of I. R of I is lift coefficient divided by AR. AR is aspect ratio, okay? So in the end, it's a lift coefficient square and pi AR. AR is inverse proportion to that. Smaller AR, large this, okay? Uh, uh, yes, large AR, smaller, the, smaller CDI in this track. So this is typical uh, elliptical lift case. This is kind of elliptical lift distribution. Then you have this relationship, okay? So finally, we uh, come out to this equation. Uh, of course, they add another uh, span efficiency factor to here in this range, but it's a constant. Okay. So qualitatively speaking, we have um, drag due to lift for this type of uh, elliptical uh, plan form. Okay. So. The induced drag goes with square of the CL proportion to that, and inverse related to the aspect ratio. Okay, aspect ratio, and this is actually called the drag due to lift. Drag due to lift. So from that you can appreciate drag due to the the total finite uh, wing. So it's equal to the infinite wing uh, drag coefficient and this guy, and this guy. So it's a profile drag and induced drag, induced drag. So if I draw CD versus CL, this is drag coefficient. So the curve would be like this. It's parabolic, okay? It's parabolic. And the minimum point is here, okay? The minimum point is here. CD is here. Okay, this is my profile drag. Okay, profile drag. And then uh, the U2 versus F15, they have totally different things. So aspect ratio is 14.3. So it's very long, very long. Okay, and this is basically this divided by that is 14.3 aspect ratio. Okay, aspect ratio. They cruise at the 70, so this is U2 is less. Uh, U2 is a, a, is a spying aircraft flying very high at 70,000 feet. Uh, air density highly reduced, so that uh, the drag is small, so it can fly longer. And fly at relatively slow speed, so, uh, so lower uh, dynamic head, dynamic pressure, high angle of attack. So the lift is high, so you can carry more. Uh, so in this case, they use a very large 
aspect ratio. The wingspan is very, very high. However, F-15 is a fighter jet, flies at a very high speed, at a lower fence air, lower attitude. So the dynamic pressure is very high. So the angle of attack could be low, OK? Could be low. And uh, the lift is also low. So aspect ratio is only three. And in this case, in this case, which one has bigger induced drag? This one, the drag is big. Because compared to this equation, this is large, then this is small. Okay? And this is small, then that is large. So that's the explains why the wing shape aspect ratio from induced drag point of view is totally understandable. Okay? Understandable. So the U2 is a spy plane. I told you that uh, it's uh, really big. It's a really big. Uh, so this is small. So aspect ratio goes really high. The drag is very low. So therefore, they can fly in the air for a long time. Okay, a long time. And for fighter jets, it's a short mission time. Fly very high speed, low angle of attack. Lift can be small at that point. And the induced drag, uh, still less than profile drag. Okay. So there are many uh, other, uh, uh, like uh, Airbus versus 747 comparison. So the different wind span, aspect ratio is um, more or less the same. Uh, the gross take of uh, weight is, um, which one is bigger? Uh, Airbus is bigger. This is Airbus, okay? 560 tons. And you can see the wind load is even actually smaller than um, the Boeing, OK? So that's very interesting. Why? It's exactly because of the aspect ratio, OK? OK. OK, so. Winglets, fences, and new winglets, whether or not. But um, I'm not going to go through that. So this is like glider stuff, OK? Glider stuff. So we have some time left, and uh, we are going to go through some of the uh, three parts of the uh, movie. So but let me quickly show you. So the aspect ratio of some of the gliders can, you look, look at this one, can be over 50. Remember Facebook? Facebook is doing a, a many aircraft with very large uh, aspect ratio. Okay, the wingspan is huge. Okay. Uh, so let me see. Find the wind change. You lift the slope. The slope is different. Yeah, we have seen this. Okay, we have seen this. Uh, so the message of this one is the lift coefficient versus uh, the angle of attack in the ideal setting with infinite wing lens. So infinite wing uh, meaning AR is infinity. Okay? It's the wingspan divided by uh, the cord. Um, so this finite wing, the AR, this is not infinite, it's a finite. Finite wing, then you can see the slope is different. Slope is different. OK? Slope is different. So finite wing aspect ratio is 5, so the slope is different. OK? So to have the same, uh, to have the same uh, lift coefficient, then you need to you need to have larger angle of attack. So we have larger angle of attack, 
you also have a large drag. Okay? So come bird wind uh, find out where. it's the same, but they they come also to the same point. This is going to zero symmetrical wind. Camber wind is the same. Okay, it's the same. Okay, summary. So in aerodynamics, we discuss infinite wind first, then we discuss finite wind. So the finite wind differ uh, in two major aspects from the infinite winds. So you have additional induced drag due to lift. The second is the lift curve for a finite wind has smaller slope. Okay. So, so in summary, in summary, induced drag is a price you pay for generation of lift. This is always true. Okay. So you have large lift, you you know, pay the drag. Okay. And this drag is proportional to the lift square coefficient, in, inverse the proportion to aspect ratio. Okay. Desired high aspect ratio can reduce indu induced drag. So that's why in the collider you have very large wind span. Compromise between structure and aerodynamics. So if you need to have a very high aerodynamic coefficient, you need a very large wind span. But structure is hard to maintain that large wind span. And so this aspect ratio is actually a very important tool as designer. Um, so more control than span efficient E. So then in a special case of elliptic lift distribution, core must vary elliptically along span. What does that mean? You cannot use a rectangular wind, right? So the wind should be like elliptic kind of thing. Okay. Anyway, there are different types of wing, and I'll show you more wings. This is just a foil, different things. So Wright Brothers used something like this, okay? The wing uh, airfoil section, and the subsonic uh, uh, P36, F51, F10. So these different uh, airfoil shapes. Uh, so there are the wing shape. So this is called the elliptic wing, okay? So why this? Why, why we don't want this rectangular wing? Okay, we, why we don't? Okay, and then we tempoed then the elliptic, the slided swept wing. This is of course slided swept wing. This is a moderate swept wing, and this is called a highly swept wing, and simple delta wing, and then is complex delta wing. So all these things. So, so I hope uh, you get the appreciation on that. Uh, aerodynamics, so I showed you the resources, I learned and reviewed all the materials and extract those essential parts for the aerodynamics for you. So I hope you can appreciate that. And this is the one I showed you, I have my um, training on the aerodynamics. And now it's time to watch a few uh, movie clips and like here. Okay. If I do this uh -uh, I don't need this. Give me a second, okay? I'm just automatically switch the mode to something I don't understand. Uh, it's here.
Module 4, Aerodynamics of Flight. This training tutorial will discuss aerodynamics of flight. In order for a pilot to safely execute maneuvers in flight, it is important to understand the aerodynamic forces acting on an aircraft in flight. The four forces acting on an aircraft in straight and level, unaccelerated flight are thrust, drag, lift, and weight. Thrust is the forward force produced by the power plant, propeller, or rotor, and is opposed by drag. Drag is the rearward, retarding force caused by air that has been disrupted by the wings, rotor, fuselage, and other protruding objects, and opposes thrust. Weight is the combined load of the aircraft itself, the crew, the fuel, and the cargo or baggage. Weight pulls the aircraft downward because of the force of gravity and is opposed by lift. Lift opposes the downward force of weight. Lift is produced by air flowing over the airfoil and acts perpendicular to the flight path through the center of lift. In straight, level, and unaccelerated flight, the sum of the forces acting on the aircraft is zero. This is, for the most part, true during climb and descending flight, but things are a bit more complicated. Any time the flight path of the aircraft is not horizontal, lift, weight, thrust, and drag vectors must each be broken down into two components. For example, during a glide, part of the weight of the aircraft points forward and therefore acts as thrust, or as the picture shows, during a climb, the weight can oppose lift and also thrust. A pilot may hold an aircraft in straight and level flight at many different airspeeds. The pilot needs to coordinate the angle of attack with the speed of the aircraft. For example, if the plane is flying at a high rate of speed, the angle of attack can be relatively low. However, if the rate of speed is low, then the pilot must have a higher angle of attack. This is caused by the amount of lift produced by the wings of the aircraft. The higher the angle of attack, the more lift is provided from the wing. If a pilot can maintain a high angle of attack and a coordinated thrust level, the aircraft can fly straight and level at low speeds. Level flight at even slightly negative angle of attack is possible at very high speed. Certain aircraft have the ability to change their direction of thrust rather than change their angle of attack, such as the Harrier jump jet on the left and the Osprey on the right. These aircraft can point their thrust straight up without having to point their nose in that direction. The Harrier jet uses vents to accomplish this and the Osprey can rotate its propellers to point up. This allows each aircraft to hover over the ground or fly straight and level very slowly. Drag is the force that resists movement of an aircraft through the air. There are two basic types, parasitic drag and induced drag. The first is called parasite because it in no way functions to aid flight while the second, induced drag, is a result of an airfoil developing lift. Parasite drag is any drag that is not caused directly from the aircraft producing lift. It is broken down into three categories, form drag, interference drag, and skin friction. Form drag is a drag that is caused by things like the cowling, antennas, and the aerodynamic shape of other components. How quickly airflow rejoins itself is determined by the shape of the object it's flowing around. As the picture on the left shows, the best way to reduce form drag is to streamline as many of the aircraft components as possible. Interference drag comes from the intersection of airstreams that creates eddy currents, turbulence, or restricts smooth airflow. For example, the picture on the right shows the intersection of the wing and the fuselage at the wing root. This area has significant interference drag. Air flowing around the fuselage collides with air flowing over the wing, 
merging into a current of air different from the two original currents. Skin friction drag comes from the surface of the aircraft not being completely smooth. Even though a surface may look smooth, it has a rough, ragged surface when viewed under a microscope. This non-smooth surface causes an interruption in airflow and more drag. Induced drag is the second basic type of drag. When an airfoil produces lift, there is always drag. This drag comes from wingtip vortexes. When the aircraft is viewed from the tail, these vortices circulate counterclockwise about the right tip and clockwise about the left tip. Bearing in mind the direction of rotation of these vortices, it can be seen that they induce an upward flow of air beyond the tip and a downwash flow behind the wing's trailing edge. This induced downwash has nothing in common with the downwash that is necessary to produce lift. It is, in fact, the source of induced drag. This downwash over the top of the airfoil at the tip has the same effect as bending the lift vector rearward. Therefore, the lift is slightly aft of perpendicular to the relative wind, creating a rearward lift component. This is induced drag. Drag is the price paid to obtain lift. The lift-to-drag ratio is the amount of lift generated by a wing or airfoil compared to its drag. This also governs the airfoil's efficiency. Aircraft with higher lift-drag ratios are more efficient than those with lower lift-drag ratios. The lift-drag ratio is determined by dividing the lift component by the drag component, or above by dividing the lift equation by the drag equation. L is the lift force in pounds. CL is the lift coefficient. P is density expressed in slugs per cubic feet. V is velocity in feet per second. Q is dynamic pressure per square feet. And S is the wing area in square feet. On the graph to the left, the lift curve, red, reaches its maximum for this particular wing section at 20 degrees angle of attack, and then rapidly decreases. 15 degrees angle of attack is therefore the stalling angle. The drag curve, yellow, increases very rapidly from 14 degrees angle of attack and completely overcomes the lift curve at 21 degrees angle of attack. The lift-drag ratio, green, reaches its maximum at 6 degrees angle of attack, meaning that at this angle, the most lift is obtained for the least amount of drag. Any angle of attack the aircraft operates at other than the lift drag max point will cause more drag. Therefore, for the least amount of drag to lift, the aircraft must fly with that angle of attack. Gravity is the pulling force that tends to draw all bodies to the center of the Earth. The center of gravity may be considered as a point at which all the weight of the aircraft is concentrated. If the aircraft were supported at its exact center of gravity, it would balance in any attitude. This weight force acts downward through the airplane's center of gravity. In stabilized level flight, where the lift force is equal to the weight force, the aircraft is in a state of equilibrium and neither gains nor loses altitude. If lift becomes less than weight, the aircraft loses altitude. When lift is greater than weight, the aircraft gains altitude. The pilot is able to control lift. If the control yoke is pushed forward or pulled back, the angle of attack changes and therefore the amount of lift changes as well. For an aircraft to continue to produce lift, the aircraft airfoil must be continually attacking new air. On helicopters, this is accomplished by the rotating blades. In a fixed-wing airplane, this is accomplished by the airflow over the wing. The lift provided from the wing is proportional to the square of the aircraft's velocity. Lift and drag also vary directly with the density of the air. Density is affected by several factors, pressure, temperature, and humidity. At an altitude of 18,000 feet, 
The density of the air has one half the density of air at sea level. In order to maintain its lift at a higher altitude, an aircraft must fly at a greater true airspeed for any given angle of attack. Warm air is less dense than cool air, and moist air is less dense than dry air. Lift varies directly with the wing area. If the wings have the same proportion in the airfoil sections, a wing with an area of 200 square feet lifts twice as much at the same angle of attack as a wing with an area of 100 square feet. For most situations, the pilot controls lift and velocity to maneuver an aircraft. As stated previously, wingtip vortices are caused when the high pressure below the wing attempts to rejoin the low pressure air around the wingtip, causing a downward and outward vortex. The above picture is a more detailed diagram of how this process looks on a wing. The heavier and slower the aircraft, the greater the angle of attack and the stronger the wingtip vortices. Wingtip vortices lead to a potentially hazardous condition called wake turbulence. To avoid wake turbulence, avoid flying through another aircraft's flight path. Rotate prior to the point at which the preceding aircraft rotated when taking off behind another aircraft. Avoid following another aircraft on a similar flight path at an altitude within a thousand feet and approach the runway above a preceding aircraft's path when landing behind another aircraft. And finally, touch down after the point at which the other aircraft's wheels contacted the runway. A hovering helicopter generates a downwash from its main rotors similar to the vortices of an airplane. Pilots of small aircraft should avoid a hovering helicopter by at least three rotor disc diameters to avoid the effects of this downwash. Wind is also an important consideration when dealing with wake turbulence because it can push around wake turbulence. For example, if there's a 10 knot wind, it will push the wake turbulence in the direction of the wind at a rate of 1,000 feet per minute. If this is a problem, pilots may also wait approximately three minutes for the wake to dissipate. Ground effect is a phenomenon that allows an aircraft to fly slower than normal a few feet from the ground. When an aircraft in flight comes within several feet of the surface, ground, or water, a change occurs in the three-dimensional flow pattern around the aircraft because the vertical component of the airflow around the wing is restricted by the surface. This alters the aerodynamics of the wing mainly. The fuselage and tail surfaces are also affected, but ground effect mainly consists of the aerodynamic characteristic changes of the wing. The reduction of the wingtip vortices due to ground effect alters the lift distribution of the wing and reduces the induced angle of attack and induced drag. Therefore, the wing will require a lower angle of attack in ground effect to produce the same lift. The reduction of induced drag due to ground effect means that less power is required to fly at a certain speed. Most of the time ground effect will produce a higher pressure at the static source and the indicated airspeed will be lower than normally required. When an aircraft is taking off, the reverse happens from landing. The aircraft taking off will require an increase in angle of attack to maintain the same lift experience an increase in induced drag and thrust required. Experience a decrease in stability and a nose-up change in moment. And experience a reduction in static source pressure and increase in indicated airspeed. This is something to consider on takeoff because it could mean a pilot attempting to take off will feel like the aircraft can lift off the ground prior to the recommended takeoff speed. As shown above, this could cause the plane to have poor initial climb performance and also, in extreme cases, prevent the aircraft from becoming airborne entirely. Hmm. Axes of an aircraft will be covered more in depth in the flight controls chapter. Please help us spread the word about pilot training system 
and we look forward to further servicing your flight training needs. So this website is amazingly good. So uh, I kind of like it. So aerodynamics, there are, uh, let me see if we have time. <laughs> axes of an aircraft will be covered more in depth in the flight controls chapter. However, it is important to know the three axes that an airplane can move on. The first is pitch. The pitch, or lateral axis, is the point that a plane will pitch its nose up or down on. The roll, or longitudinal axis of an aircraft, is the point where the airplane will roll to the left or right. And the yaw, or vertical axis, is the axis that the plane will yaw on or move its nose left and right. It is also important to note that each of these lines runs through the airplane's center of gravity. Each aircraft responds to control inputs differently, and therefore handles differently. For example, a smaller aircraft might respond rapidly to control inputs, while a large transport aircraft may feel sluggish and slow to respond to inputs. These features can be designed into an aircraft to facilitate the particular purpose of the aircraft by considering certain stability and maneuvering requirements. There are two types of stability, static and dynamic. Static stability refers to the initial tendency or direction of movement back to equilibrium. In aviation, it refers to the aircraft's initial response when disturbed from a given angle of attack, slip, or bank. Positive static stability is the initial tendency of the aircraft to return to the original state of equilibrium after being disturbed. Neutral static stability is the initial tendency of the aircraft to remain in a new condition after its equilibrium has been disturbed. Negative static stability is the initial tendency of the aircraft to continue away from the original state of equilibrium after being disturbed. Dynamic stability refers to the aircraft response over time when disturbed from a given angle of attack, slip, or bank. This type of stability also has three subtypes. Positive dynamic stability, neutral dynamic stability, and negative dynamic stability. These act in the same way as the static subtypes, but these subtypes explain the same relation over time as shown on the above graph. Stability in an aircraft affects two areas significantly, movement and controllability. In designing an aircraft, a great deal of effort is spent in developing the desired degree of stability around all three axes. But longitudinal stability about the lateral axis is considered to be the most affected by certain variables in various flight conditions. Longitudinal stability is the quality that makes an aircraft stable about its lateral axis. An aircraft with an unstable longitudinal axis will have a tendency to dive or climb and can become unsafe to fly. Static longitudinal stability or instability in an aircraft is dependent upon three factors. Location of the wing with respect to the center of gravity, location of the horizontal tail surfaces with respect to the center of gravity, and the area or size of the tail surfaces. The above picture shows these forces balanced in flight. The center of lift in most asymmetrical airfoils has a tendency to change its fore and aft positions with a change in the angle of attack. The change in lift tends to move forward with an increase in angle of attack and to move aft with a decrease in angle of attack. This means that when the angle of attack of an airfoil is increased, the center of lift, by moving forward, tends to lift the leading edge of the wing still more. This tendency gives the wing an inherent quality of instability. Most aircraft are designed with a nose heavy or a center of gravity that is in front of the center of lift. Even when the horizontal stabilizer is level during flight, downwash from the wings pushes the horizontal stabilizer down. Generally, the manufacturer of the aircraft will give the horizontal stabilizer 
an angle that will provide the most stability during flight at a given speed and power setting, as shown above. For a nose-heavy plane, when the airspeed is slow and there is less downwash on the tail, the nose will pitch over more aggressively. Thrust can also affect the longitudinal stability of an aircraft. Reduced power causes less downwash and causes the nose of a nose-heavy airplane to naturally pitch down, which is a desirable characteristic in an aircraft in order to make stall recovery easier. Stability about the aircraft's longitudinal axis, which extends from the nose of the aircraft to its tail, is called lateral stability. There are four main design factors that make an aircraft laterally stable. Dihedral, sweep back, keel effect, and weight distribution. A dihedral design is when the wings are connected to the fuselage a few degrees higher than from being perpendicular. Therefore, when the aircraft is viewed straight on, the wings point slightly upward like a V. The angle of attack stays high if one wing is lowered and will attempt to lift back to its stable position. If the other wing is lowered in the process, it will then be lower and raise up until the oscillations subside. In addition to a dihedral design, aircraft may also have wings that are swept back. This design allows the lower wing's leading edge to hit perpendicular to the relative wind. This causes greater lifting effect, and the wing restores to its original position. An aircraft always has the tendency to turn the longitudinal axis of the aircraft into the relative wind. This weather vane tendency is similar to the keel of a ship and exerts a steadying influence on the aircraft laterally about the longitudinal axis. When the wing dips, the weight of the lower half of the plane acts as a pendulum to steady the aircraft. This effect is called the keel effect, and its effectiveness can be changed by weight distribution to make more of the aircraft under the center of gravity. Stability about the aircraft's vertical axis, the sideways moment, is called yawing, or directional stability. Yawing, or directional stability, is the most easily achieved stability in aircraft design because the vertical fin and the fuselage aft of the center of gravity are the main contributing parts that cause the aircraft to weather vane or point its nose into the wind. If the area of the fuselage aft of the center of gravity is larger than in front of the center of gravity, the aircraft will be vertically stable. Also, to add to the stability, a vertical fin is added much like the feather on an arrow. The fin being placed on the tail helps keep the wind from yawing the aircraft to the left or right. Free directional oscillations, or Dutch roll, is the tendency of the aircraft to yaw and roll in a figure eight formation. However, most aircraft are built with spiral instability instead. This instability causes the plane to yaw in one direction and if not corrected, the aircraft will enter a deep spiral dive. However, this tendency is usually easily controlled by the pilot. An aircraft is not turned like a car or a boat. To turn, the aircraft must be banked. When the aircraft is banked, the lift acting does not act straight up and down. In a turn, the lift component is broken up into a vertical and horizontal component. The horizontal component is the force that is involved with turning the plane to either side. If the lift and weight continued to act straight up and down in a bank, the plane would remain pointed in the same direction. The rudder is used to correct any deviation between the straight track of the nose and tail of the aircraft. A good turn is one in which the nose and tail of the aircraft track along the same path. If no rudder is used in a turn, the nose of the aircraft yaws to the outside of the turn. The rudder is used to bring the nose back in line with the relative wind. The important thing to consider is that the horizontal lift component, not the rudder, is used to turn the plane. During a turn, the aircraft loses some of its vertical lift, which requires back pressure on the elevator to maintain a consistent angle of attack. 
Also during a turn, the increased drag causes the airplane to lose airspeed. If a constant speed, constant rate turn is required, then additional power may be needed. An aircraft is balanced whether it is in straight and level flight or in a climb. However, to transition from straight and level to a climb, there must be back elevator pressure applied. When this happens, the wings have an increased angle of attack and momentarily generate more lift. If no power was added for the climb, the airspeed would gradually diminish because the thrust required for a climb is greater than the thrust required for level flight. An aircraft is able to climb at a certain airspeed only because of excess thrust. When this thrust is gone, the aircraft will no longer be able to climb and will start to lose airspeed. This same principle is applicable to descents. During a descent, elevator pressure is applied forward, which causes the wings to momentarily have less lift. This causes the nose to drop and the airplane will start to descend. This time, the power must be reduced to maintain a constant airspeed. When an aircraft rapidly loses lift on its wings, a stall occurs because the critical angle of attack for the airfoil has been reached. Stalls are one of the most misunderstood areas of aerodynamics because pilots often believe an airfoil stops producing lift when it stalls. In a stall, the wing does not totally stop producing lift. Rather, it cannot generate adequate lift to sustain level flight. Most aircraft are designed to stall from the wing root out to the wing tip. This provides the ailerons to have some authority during a stall. The stalling speed of a particular aircraft is not a fixed value for all flight situations. But a given aircraft always stalls at the same angle of attack regardless of airspeed, weight, load factor, or density altitude. A stall can happen at low or high speeds and during turns, not just when the aircraft is flying slowly. In the picture above, the pilot is traveling at 100 knots, but pulls back on the elevator sharply. The result is that because gravity and centrifugal force prevent the aircraft from immediately changing directions, so the angle of attack is increased from low to very high and the aircraft could stall. When centrifugal forces are added, such as in a turn, the stall speed increases. Most training aircraft are built with the center of gravity in front of the center of lift. This means that during a stall, the aircraft will rotate about its center of gravity and nose down. This condition is better than having the center of gravity behind the center of lift, because if the nose cannot pitch down during a stall, the aircraft will remain in a stalled state until it contacts the ground. If ice is allowed to accumulate on the aircraft during flight, the weight of the aircraft is increased while the ability to generate lift is decreased. As little as 0.8 millimeters of ice on the upper wing surface increases drag and reduces aircraft lift by 25%. Pilots can encounter icing in any season, anywhere in the country, at altitudes of up to 18,000 feet and sometimes higher. Hmm. The aircraft propeller consists of two or more blades and a central hub to which the blades are attached. Each blade of an aircraft propeller is essentially a rotating wing. Hmm. As a result of their construction, the propeller blades are like airfoils and produce forces that create the thrust to pull or push the aircraft through the air. A cross section of the blade shows that the top surface has a camber much like the top of the wing, and the bottom is flat, much like the bottom of a wing. The cord line in a propeller is the line drawn from the leading edge to the trailing edge. On a propeller, the thicker end is the leading edge. As shown above, each section of a propeller blade moves downward and forward. The angle that the propeller strikes the relative wind is its angle of attack, which produces thrust. Also, this blade's camber acts just like a wing to create forward lift. The pitch, or blade angle, says how much of a bite the propeller has or how much air it handles in one rotation. 
On most smaller aircraft, the pitch or blade angle is set and cannot be changed. But in larger aircraft, the pilot may change this to adjust the load on the propeller and to control engine RPM. These propeller systems are called constant speed propellers. Propeller efficiency can range anywhere from 50 to 87 percent, depending on how much it slips. Propeller slip is the difference between the geometric pitch of the propeller and its effective pitch. The difference is geometric pitch refers to the theoretical distance a blade should travel through the air, and the effective pitch is the amount the blade actually travels. If the effective pitch is in a shorter amount of time than the geometric pitch, the propeller travels through the air too quickly, and that is referred to as a slip. The reason a propeller is twisted is to ensure that when the blade is spinning, the angle of attack of the blade to the air stays the same. If the blade were not twisted, for example, the part of the blade near the hub would be traveling slower than the part of the blade near the tip. This causes the part of the blade near the hub to potentially have a negative angle of attack and the part near the tip to have a high angle of attack and be stalled during cruise. Therefore, to maximize the efficiency of the blade, the blade is twisted. To the pilot, torque, or the left turning tendency of the airplane, is made up of four elements which cause or produce a twisting or rotating motion around at least one of the airplane's three axes. These four elements are torque reaction from engine and propeller, corkscrewing effect of the slipstream, gyroscopic action of the propeller, and asymmetrical loading of the propeller, or P-factor. Torque reaction causes the aircraft to roll because the engine components are moving in one direction. So, according to Newton's third law of physics, on the airplane above, there must be an equal and opposite reaction. Most newer aircraft are built with their engines offset to counteract this tendency. When the airplane is on the ground, this roll tendency is translated to the vertical axis and causes yaw. During takeoff, this yaw tendency is canceled by the pilot's use of rudder. Because of the high-speed rotation of the blade, the slipstream ends up being a corkscrew, which yaws the aircraft about its vertical axis. The more compact the spiral, the more predominant the force. However, as speed increases, the corkscrew elongates and becomes less effective. When airborne, this effect also causes the aircraft to roll on its longitudinal axis. The rolling moment caused by the corkscrew flow of the slipstream is to the right, while the rolling moment caused by the torque reaction is to the left. These forces would seem to cancel each other out, but they vary greatly, and it is the pilot's responsibility to control each tendency, regardless of which is more prominent. To understand gyroscopic action, you must first understand how gyroscopes respond to forces. The picture on the top shows a force being applied to a gyroscope. From the force acting upwards on the gyroscope, it should be noted that the response is yaw instead of the expected pitching motion. This is because when a gyroscope is spinning, the resultant force always takes place 90 degrees in the direction the gyroscope is spinning. In an aircraft, we can simulate that same force by pitching the nose up and down. The applied force is from the tail of the aircraft, and the resulting force takes effect 90 degrees in the direction the propeller is spinning, in this case counterclockwise from the pilot's view, and therefore the plane would yaw to the right. The pilot must control this motion with proper use of the elevator and the rudder. When an aircraft is flying at a high angle of attack, the blade of the propeller moving downward has a bigger bite than the blade moving upward. This causes the center of thrust to be moved to the right side of the prop disc area, which causes a yawing movement toward the left. The reason is that the blade moving downward has a greater speed through the air because it's moving into the wind, while the blade moving up 
travels with the wind. Because the propeller is an airfoil, the faster the blade moves through the air, the more lift it produces. Therefore, the faster moving blade causes an unbalanced forward thrust, called P-factor, or the asymmetrical loading of the propeller. Please help us spread the word about Pilot Training System, and we look forward to further service in your flight training. Where well, you skip part three so you can finish on time. So aerodynamics is, uh, I think that this level is good enough for you to pass the knowledge test. So these two parts I showed you is at that level, okay? At that level. And the class I covered is a little bit more in depth. So go through those slides and read the rest of the part three of this module. So then consider yourself uh, well informed on aerodynamics part. I cannot say educated, but informed. So you have confidence in uh, taking the FAA uh, knowledge test uh, in the aerodynamics section. So with that, I'll see you tomorrow in the lab. Okay?